Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Presented today by Breda Pest Management. Spring practice rolls on for UGA. And, of course, as we have been, we are right in the middle of following everything that goes on, including a chance to see some of practice yesterday for the uh, folks there uh, who were in Athens, including uh, our Connor Riley. Great story from him at DogNation.com. By the way, Connor asked us yesterday what we wanted to see, and followed up on trying to uh, observe that during practice. Good stuff from him. We'll also have Mike Griffith on the show today. We'll find out what Mike saw at UGA practice yesterday there as well. So uh, a lot of different eyes on Georgia spring practice, and we'll get that coverage coming up on the uh, program today. That's going to be really good stuff. Also, Kirby Smart gave a pretty significant compliment to one of the most important, I don't want to call him newcomers because he's been here, but guys stepping up into a much bigger role this year. Kirby, far more complimentary of this player than we oftentimes hear Kirby be. I think that matters for Georgia as the building blocks get put together for the 2024 season. In fact, I think that matters so much that I want to start with that here today. So let's get it going. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Breda Pest Management, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Breda Pest Management, the official pest control of UGA Athletics. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So Kirby Smart did something yesterday that he almost never does. I started the show, was it Monday maybe? I forget when it was. Uh, days sort of run together, but I was talking about how, you know, we go through all of the various press conferences, the things that Kirby says, the things that the players say, and as sort of a medium minded person, I'm looking for what's interesting. I'm looking for the most exciting quotes. And that's the stuff that I pull out. I probably sometimes make that stuff, blow it up, make it bigger than it's supposed to be. And I joked earlier this week that Kirby probably hates that kind of thing, right? It's like, you know, Kirby likes for football to be kind of done talking with helmets, not the press conference, not the chat or not what the players say, but the action being between the white lines. And so, therefore, it sometimes seems like that Kirby Smart and the football staff in Georgia kind of play defense against anything interesting being said around spring practice. In sharp contrast to other programs that sometimes around this time of year We'll talk about all the stuff they're going to do and the players that are doing great. And there's a lot of hype kind of intentionally so around some programs. Georgia seems to go out of its way to avoid all of that kind of stuff. And you all are, of course, quite aware of most of that. However, a little bit of a counterexample to that this week, and this is mostly in fun, but we heard Kirby Smart give an individual compliment to a specific Georgia player in a way that he almost never does, glowing praise for one player, the work ethic that he's showing, the way in which he's demonstrating himself apparently to be ready to play for Georgia this season. I found this to be pretty remarkable, so much so that I wanted to begin the show by talking to you about that today. The man's name is Jared Wilson. Jared, we would believe, is next in line to be Georgia center. And it sounds like as the work gets done to replace Cedric Von Prong Granger, obviously manned that position as well as anybody could for the last few years here. Kirby Smart made it very, very clear that not only does he like what he's seeing from Jared Wilson, he can't wait for everybody else to see it there as well. This is strong stuff from Kirby Smart from yesterday. Take a look and a listen to this. Yeah, I, I'm excited for the rest of the world to get to see Jared Wilson. This is a guy that, uh, number one, is I don't put a lot of high expectations on people and, and annoy people. He has a lot to do to be the best player he can be. But when you talk about athleticism at the center position, this guy runs faster than than uh, a lot of our, our our defensive backs, believe it or not, our tight ends, our quarterbacks. I mean, his, his numbers, extremely athletic, over 300 pounds, uh, can get to the second level as quick as anybody just really athletic. So he, he's had the great fortune of learning from said. Unfortunately, that's not a position that you rotated at a ton. So he didn't get a lot of opportunities to go and play like maybe a, a Mims or a Dylan Fairchild. They got to go in the game and play. He didn't get an opportunity to do a lot of those things, but he is a really, really good athlete and even better person. Um, he's got, you know, a younger brother that's uh, going to be a really talented football player as well. And we just enjoyed um, his leadership. And I'm looking forward to, you know, the center being the leader of the group. Like said was, he's taking on a new role and kind of doing it his way. Now, I've told you all before, 
there is a certain aspect of my personality that's a little bit like a carnival barker, a circus ringmaster, sort of a wrestling announcer. I, I like hype. I just do. I, I, I like, you know, I, I like big, loud things, and I kind of always have. There's a certain aspect of my personality that's always going to gravitate in that direction. So somebody who sort of has the sort of pro wrestling style carnival, carnival barker hype man tendency – when Kirby Smart says during a spring practice press conference that he's so impressed with a Georgia relative newcomer that he can't wait for the world to see just how good this player is. Like, there's a part of that for me that, of course, I'm going to take the bait on that. And that's the kind of thing that sort of looks good in a headline. It sort of looks good as a big above the marquee type, you know, like, you know, like the movie quotes of like, oh, this is the must see hit of the summer. I mean, can't wait for the world to see this guy. I mean, doesn't that sound good that gets you excited? And obviously, we're not going to you know make too much of this, but it is kind of fun to hear Kirby Smart impressed with what he's seeing from Jared Wilson right now. And the other thing is, while it's a little bit against type for Kirby Smart to praise a player this much, if Kirby ever was going to praise a player, this is very much on brand for the reason why Kirby Smart would praise him and the sort of player that he would praise the player who's been waiting the wings, the player who's been working hard, the player who's been pushing his athleticism to the full extent for a big man of what it's probably capable of doing. That if Kirby was ever going to kind of lose his mind in terms of overly complimenting a player, this is the sort of player he would compliment like that and the sort of reasons for why he would give those compliments, even though the actual praise is a little bit against type for Kirby, the reasons for the praise are almost exactly what you would have expected. Does that make sense? So, um, I also think there's some substance to this there as well. Georgia needs Jared Wilson. Georgia has had, I would say, the best center in America now for what feels like the last 50 years. I mean, it seems like Cedric Von Prong Granger has been playing at Georgia for half a century, and his absence leaves big shoes to fill. It's one of the major questions I would have had for Georgia. And when Kirby is that confident, now he also said, listen, he's still got a lot of work to do to be the best player he can be, and we all understand all of that. But when Kirby expresses some confidence in what Wilson can be, because to a lot of us, Wilson was a relative unknown when he came in to the program. And maybe, you know, you weren't quite so sure what he was, you know, last little bit there as well because of the reason that Kirby mentioned, that you're not rotating at center. And so he's not playing as much as other youngish Georgia offensive linemen have been able to play. But I do think you take it kind of seriously when Kirby Smart says that he likes what he sees. And – it becomes easy to understand why that might be the case. As Kirby points out, this is a guy who was apprenticed under uh, a guy like Cedric Von Prahn Granger, who always, and I mean always, without fail, played the game the right way, approached the game with the right mindset. And so, of course, it would just stand to reason you would have a great chance to learn from the way in which SVP approached football on a daily basis here at UGA. In fact, yesterday, Jared Wilson, who we're talking about, also met with the reporters, and he made it very clear that, oh, my gosh, what he absorbed by listening to and learning Cedric Von Prong Granger, that's the stuff that's setting him up for what might come next as the starting center, perhaps, in his football career. This is really, really good from Jared Wilson on how much he learned from the guy that Kirby Smart just referenced, Cedric Von Prong Granger, the previous center at Georgia. Here is a Jared Wilson from yesterday. Sid, I guess his, his leadership, like everybody knows about his leadership, is this world round, so, I mean, Said he's. It's just like I can't even put into words how great of a leader he is, and like I wouldn't even have to like go ask him a question. He would lead so much that he would say things that just would answer other people's questions. That you know maybe a young guy who is not, you know, is kind of scared to maybe raise his voice and ask a question. Maybe like he would answer your question just by leading the whole group. So like it was, it was probably one of the easiest transitions I've ever had, just because I've had a, a great leader in him. Let me give you a quick aside for a moment. We do a broadcast here. It's not a narrow cast. It's a broadcast, which means we want topics that are the most friendly to a broad audience. That means it's a lot of quarterbacks, a lot of wide receivers. It's a lot of, you know, things like that. It's not often that we start a show by talking about the Georgia Center, in other words. That's not the kind of thing that we would typically do. But if you want to really be impressed and if you want more detail about why Kirby Smart said as many complimentary things about Wilson as he said yesterday, go watch Jared Wilson's interview in the Dog Nation YouTube page. If you don't feel like you know him very well now, oh, my gosh, does this feel like the next generation of Cedric Von Prahn, the same stuff you thought, gosh, this SVP guy, he feels like he's 35 years old. He's like, you know, the most mature-sounding guy in the world. You know, if, if you felt that way about SVP, and you should have, 
Jared Wilson feels very much like the next generation of all that. It's worth your time to go out of your way to find that interview, that press conference from yesterday on the Dog Nation YouTube page. I think you'll be very impressed. Now, that said, let me also kind of move to the next phase of this discussion because all of this is very much in keeping with the topic we discussed yesterday about what Kirby Smart said the goal for the team during spring practice is. Smart's way of describing this yesterday was we got to find guys who are above the line. We've got to find guys who, in so many words, we trust to put into football games. What we said was you can go through and look at every position group, and I think you can put the guys in that group into sort of a couple different categories. You have within most position groups a handful of like sure things, known commodities, and a handful of guys who haven't had a chance to demonstrate that's what they are yet, but that's the kind of thing with more experience or more opportunity they possibly could be. And this spring is sort of trying to move some guys from the, hey, they've got promise, they've got possibilities, into the group of, we think this could be someone that we really trust to have in a football game. And when you hear what Kirby Smart is saying there about Wilson, I think you're led to believe, okay, well, he has either already or in the process of moving from the category of this is what he could be to this is what we think he is. And within the Georgia offensive line, I think that's a really good thing because of the fact that Georgia's offensive line has an interesting mix of like really proven true things, I think now, things that you know for sure and things that you're hopeful of in order for Georgia to achieve everything it can here this season. And when I think about that, I think back to the other day when Amarius Mims, who's now on his way to the NFL draft, when he was at Pro Day kind of reflecting on what's left behind him at Georgia, you know, a guy that got that early playing time last year is a very young guy, Ernest Green. This is a guy we probably don't talk about nearly as much as we should, but this is a guy that when you think about what are the known commodities in the Georgia offensive line? What are you confident and sure about as you get ready for this upcoming season? But when you make that list of the guys who, to use Smart's phrase, are above the line, I think Ernest Green's got to be one of the guys that you really write in in ink and really have a great level of trust in. In fact, uh, you know, the other day, Amarius Mims talked about how valuable he thinks this next year for Ernest Green can be as he takes another step with his football career. This is good stuff from Mims on Green as the subject of the offensive line is coming together here from last week. Definitely a great leader. Ernest is a great player. Like I said, he's he's kind of like Mario almost. Like I said, he had to go through that learning year freshman year. Mm-hmm. But um, like I said, last year he got a whole year starting under his belt. Man, I expect, like I said, some crazy things for him. So go with me on this journey for a moment. I have been very bullish with the Georgia offensive line for most of this offseason, feeling like that group had a chance to be really good once again. And I've also been very clear about how important I think that is for Georgia's overall success. When I hear Mim say, Ernest Green, oh, my gosh, what a leader, you know, how great he was to get that experience. Now he's just ready to kind of be a dominator. Boom. That's a guy above the line. That's one of your sure things there on the offensive line. When I hear Kirby Smart saying very complimentary things about Jared Wilson, when I listen to Wilson talk himself and how polished and professional he already sounds, that's a guy that I would say, used to be I didn't really know much about him at all. All of a sudden now I'm going to borrow the confidence of people who know him better, and all of a sudden now I'm going to believe that Wilson may be one of those above-the-line type players. And all of a sudden now you've got a lot more stability with your offensive line based on how spring practice is kind of rolling out here. Tate Ratledge is obviously one of the guys that you feel pretty good about on that. And now you're also watching to see, okay, what about the group of other like younger guys? Who from that group can also step up there as well? And for that point, I want to go back to Amarius Mims again here because in the midst of time at the left tackle, Ernest Green, what that is, he also flipped it over and talked about right tackle there as well where Xavier Truss is working as the starter right now. And that was spotted once again yesterday at Georgia practice. But you've also got a younger guy like Monroe Freeling traveling a similar path to what Green traveled a year ago, got some experience last year, but now ready for more of that perhaps in 2024, using this spring practice right now as the time to get ready for that. And by the way, the other day, Mims had some very interesting things to say about Monroe Freeling too. Uh, I expect a lot from him. The guy who, like I said, as a freshman, feel that a lot. You know, got some major playing time. Like I said, I look at a guy who's hungry. Really, like I said, he was really like rotating in behind me and trust on. So a guy who's more familiar. He's in, he knew the plays when I was here. So I definitely know he has a, a grasp of the playbook now. Like I said, it's going to be, I definitely expect him, like I said, take that next step of, like I said, that rotating, that rotating, um, 
I want to say that rotating thing like we did yeah. with Brock, me, Brock, mm -hmm. more about yeah. sophomore year. Yeah. So like I said, I expect big things from him this year. Mm -hmm. All right, listen, let me, let me see if I can sum all of this up. Kirby Smart, when he praises said, uh, uh, Jared Wilson the way that he did, of course, that's just really fun. It's a little bit different than what we're used to hearing, but it's more than just fun. It's more than just curious. It's also important. Georgia needs a guy like Wilson to step up, to join what we think Ernest Green already is, the sort of sure thing, trusted, dependable force there at the left tackle. If Georgia can get that from its center position again, even though it's a first-year starter, how valuable would that be to go along with a guy like Tate Ratlich, whose return uh, was really important for Georgia? Two different guys at left guard between Micah Morris and Dylan Fairchild, who we think are capable of that. And uh, joining a guy like Xavier Truss, who's also a veteran presence there as well. And then in addition to that, guys like Monroe Freeling taking that next step. Other young players looking for their chance to blossom. Kirby Smart says, we want to find guys who are above the line. Guys that we trust to put into a football game. The number of players along the Georgia offensive line have earned that trust. It appears to be going up. And Jared Wilson could be leading the way. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Breda Pest Management. We're glad to have you with us, no matter how you get to us, live on video, 10 a.m. across all platforms, radio, Athens Sports Radio, 96 The Ref, podcast, wherever you find them. And my gosh, so many of you have been so kind to just be so loyal to us on the podcast for so many years, and we really, you know, do our best to deliver that to you consistently each and every day, dropping right there at Apple and Spotify and the worldfamousdognation.com right there, in that 12 o'clock hour right there at noon and you're clicking in you're a part of that it's the it's the platform we started on originally and i just love the fact that so many of you uh continue to make that really i would say our most popular platform overall even after all these years and so thank you so much for your continued support of us on podcast video people we love you too but every now and then i'd like to give a special shout out to the people who helped to start this in fact for our dog nation bracket challenge I was talking to one of the guys of the day because everybody who's emailing me, I'm emailing them back and just thanking them for being a part of it. And uh, he's like, I believe I've been here since episode one, which now we're 2,100 episodes, something like that. I was like, it's just great to know that we got podcast people who've been with us that long. That's that's really fun for me to consider. And I certainly appreciate all that. I also appreciate our friends at Breda Past Management who are making this show possible here today. You think about the official pest control provider of UG Athletics. By the way, speaking of UG Athletics, big win last night in the NIT tournament against Xavier. And if you were at Stegman Coliseum, if you're watching on TV, when you see the uh, the venue, they used to call it the Stegosaurus. I don't think they call it anymore. But when you see Stegman Coliseum there, keep in mind, that venue kept bug and critter free, termite free from our friends at Breda Pass Management. And you yourself can work with the same pest control company that's taking care of those UG athletic venues, you can have them taking care of your home or your commercial property or your rental property, whatever else. You can have them doing that for you there as well. And this is more than just sort of prestige and bragging rights. This is also a chance to put more money back in your pocket just for making that decision. That's what Breda Pest Management is all about because – their legacy, their heritage, their history of service. They've been in business since 1975. They got 125 employees stretched all across of our market area here, taking good folks, taking care of folks each and every day. That history of success provides them leverage they want you to be able to use for your benefit, which is to save money for making that switch. You get the letter in the mail from your current sort of fly by night termite company, the cost of service is going up. It's not going to happen at Brady Pest Manager. When you make the switch, you're going to put more money back in your pocket just for making that choice. And these days, finding a way to do that is really, really important. So I want you to find them online. It's BradaPest.com. B-R-E-D-A, BradaPest.com. One more time. B-R-E-D-A, BradaPest.com. The official pest control provider of UGA Athletics. All right. It's Mike Griffith coming up in a moment. We'll get some eyewitness accounts of what Mike saw from Georgia Spring Practice Yesterday, a little bit of a media viewing period for our folks there in Athens. Prior to that, I'm going to go around the doghouse. And yesterday we had kind of a fun moment in the show where Connor Riley, uh, who knew that we enjoy the practice reports, and we kind of make a big deal about those on the show here. He said, all right, B.A., who do you want to talk about? Who do you want to see? And I'll go make a note of them during spring practice. And so I asked for, we had really three guys, right? We said Ellis Robinson, K.J. Bolden on the defensive uh, side of the ball, and we said Colby Young on the on the offensive side of the ball because there's been a lot of buzz around Young. 
I'm going to save the Colby stuff for tomorrow because I do think there's some interesting stuff going on there. But Connor was good on his word. And in fact, if you go read at dognation.com, you can read his write-up on those guys and other, other things that he saw from practice yesterday. A lot of this is pretty interesting stuff. I want to highlight a couple of things, thing, things, uh, things here. Now, uh, what Connor writes is, is that they were doing kind of one of those, Kirby, I think, in a coaching clinic one time called this Millennial Oklahoma. It's sort of like the, the sort of, you know, you kind of go out there and make sort of the pass play on the edge or something like that. But yesterday, so what what uh, Kirby, uh, what uh, Connor writes at dognation.com is that uh, running back Roderick Robinson uh, did not care one bit about Ellis Robinson's credentials as the sophomore running back trucked the freshman cornerback in a perimeter tackling drill. Connor writes that Roderick Robinson has 60 pounds on Ellis Robinson, uh, and it showed during this drill. He says Ellis Robinson's going to need to continue to add strength and be a willing tackler if he's going to make an early impact for the Bulldogs or something. Uh, he says Robinson and fellow five-star freshman K.J. Bolden also had a tough time bringing down uh, running back Chauncey Bowens during a different rep there as well. So Ellis Robinson versus Roderick Robinson, it doesn't go well for Ellis. There's a lot of welcome to Georgia moments that happen for a lot of players. Ellis Robinson joins a very distinguished list in all of that. But in the case of Roderick Robinson, this is not nothing for me, right? Because you say, well, a cornerback couldn't tackle the running back. But in a game, cornerbacks are also going to be trying to tackle Roderick Robinson there as well. And I just think one of the easiest things to notice, you're watching high school football or something like that, one of the easiest things to notice about a skill set that can translate is, you know, do you run through arm tackles? You know, can you can you uh, kind of just sort of bust through would-be tacklers? And even though Ellis is much smaller and also a little bit younger than what Roderick Robinson is, the fact that Roderick did that yesterday, I think, is one of the reasons why there's been some sort of pre-spring buzz about what Roderick and sort of the thunderous style running back can perhaps be paired with uh, Trevor Etienne uh, this year here for Georgia. So that's kind of a fun blurb of something that the media saw. I don't think it says one bad thing about Ellis or K.J. Bold or anything like that. A lot of very good football players have been welcomed into Georgia but it does make me a little bit more intrigued about the power with which Roderick Robinson approaches the game with and the fact that we could see more of that from him later on this fall and on G-Day there as well. Another sort of interesting note that Connor put in his practice report, and you should read the entire thing, it's totally free, at dognation.com, uh, some kind of hard coaching from Kirby yesterday, but not just the players. How about coaching the coaches a little bit there too? Connor writing at dognation.com, the Kirby Smart wasn't just using his microphone, and people know Kirby sort of wears the microphone to help amplify his voice and also save him from getting hoarse. And as people have pointed out, for a coach like Kirby who's so secretive, this daggum microphone, you can hear the thing all the way into Watkinsville. So uh, if you're ever around there, you probably heard that thing echoing through the night or, or through the, the, the Athens sky a little bit. But anyway, uh, Connor writes at dognation.com that Smart wasn't just using his microphone to get into the players, uh, but also the coaches, new defensive backs coach Dante Williams and Travaris Robinson both caught Smart's ire after the Georgia head coach was less, uh, left unsatisfied with the defensive backs' effort during a pursuit drill, basically telling you know the coaches, I want to hear you getting on these players more. So if you want to know how intense it is at Georgia spring practice right now, you got Kirby getting on everybody, and then Kirby getting on the coaches to get on the players a little harder. So uh, Georgia is certainly not resting on any laurels here. It sounds like they're working just as hard as ever, and that is a fun thing to consider. And that is Around the Doghouse here on Dog Nation Daily, uh, presented by Breda Pest Management here today. Now, a couple of things here before we bring on Mike Griffith. Thing number one is this. Before we're done, I want to give you a couple of important updates on our Dog Nation Daily Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge. Response to this has been great. We're getting up and running there on that, so I've got another update for you on that here in a little bit. Also, let me give a shout-out to our friends at the Finish Long Drink here, there as well. Talk about spring practice. Spring practice means spring. And I got to tell you, I love the Finish Long Drink during the spring. One of my favorite things in the world uh, to be outside, enjoying a back porch, enjoying a back patio, or just hanging out around the pool here coming up very soon. All kinds of varieties of the uh, Finish Long Drink for you to enjoy. The peach-flavored version, the peach date for a limited time, the Long Drink Cranberry the long drink uh, traditional, by the way, our friend Kaylee Manzel, who's taking a little uh, vacation time this week, she was telling me that she is fully on board now with the uh, blue can, the uh, grapefruit flavor, the gin kick that is the long drink traditional. So we're sort of team blue 
here when it comes to the finished long drink. She has joined me on all of that. Whichever version you think you like, uh, it's time for you to try it or it's time for you to get some more as we head towards what I really think of as the sort of finished long drink time of the year. Uh, right here during that spring, you kind of roll into some great times on that. Love, love playing golf and have a little finished long drink to go along with that. Just a great, great time. So go online, thelongdrink.com. You can put in your zip code. You can find out where to pick some up. Uh, or you can also just sort of see the story about how the finished long drink started in Helsinki and has made its way over the course of uh, a long time here, now in America, now in Georgia, and now wherever you are there as well. So thelongdrink.com, you can find out where to pick some up today. And it's, of course, always great to have the finished long drink as a part of Dog Nation Daily. Before we're done on the show today, in a few minutes' time, Kirby Smart, some very forceful words yesterday about what he views as the current landscape of the NIL culture around college football this is interesting from a number of angles, probably as candid as we've heard Kirby be on the subject as of late. We'll get to that today before we're done. But for now, on everything else that happened at Georgia Spring Practice yesterday, let's talk to Mike Griffith right now, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pass Management. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. A little late getting to Mike here, so let me jump right into it. Always great to have extra pairs of eyes there in Athens. Mike's got the spring practice background. Boy, you talk about the nice little, was that, I guess that's a sunset. I can tell that's a sunset or a sunrise. Either way, it looks great. Uh, Mike, we just talked about some of the things that Connor saw at, at Georgia practice yesterday. How about your own eyewitness account of what you were able to see? Yeah, I mean, I've been more excited about Anthony Evans um, than any receiver. Um, I just love his quickness in his hands. And, and you know, Colby's, uh, Colby is dealing with an ankle, as Kirby said. I don't know that we've really seen enough to say whether or not that long frame will apply. How physical uh, can he be? Can he get off press coverage? We know he's a jumper. Can he run by anybody? Can he separate from people? I don't know that. Um, I'm more bullish on Anthony Evans at the moment. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Colby Young is going to be a great red zone target because he is tall and long, uh, but he's not thick. He's not Lawrence Cager. And so uh, I still wonder about that. Kirby kind of downplayed London Humphreys a little bit yesterday, reminded everybody how young he is. And, and I've kind of been skeptical of, of Humphreys myself since he came in. And uh, obviously there were some people racing way ahead. Uh, with high expectations. I felt like Kirby kind of downplayed that. But I think Anthony Evans looks really good out there. I think he's got a chance to maybe be a, a game changer. Like the way Gunnar Stockton's throwing the ball, uh, I think he probably got some confidence out of that pro day performance. And uh, he's got a real nice touch on the short balls. Actually, I think he throws the short ball a little bit better than Carson to the running backs. Um, Carson, obviously, the established starter and the guy that you know, George's hopes will rest with him, but feeling better and better, uh, B.A., about Gunnar Stockton uh, as a backup. And and then Oscar Delt, you know, Oscar had some good moments last year, uh, also dropped a few balls. Uh, he talked about being on the jugs machine, getting that chemistry with Carson. I mean, look, nobody's going to be Brock Bowers, but I still think the Georgia tight ends are going to create some mismatches and bring the offense a lot of dimensions, and I think that's going to be important. I think the run game and the play action will probably be leaned on more this year, uh, as I think the receiving core has got some work to do. So I noticed those things, looked over to the offensive line, looked like Nair Daniels. Uh, you know, this is a guy that's lost a lot of weight. Yeah. Um, and, and Kirby had said at the start of uh, at the start of spring that, that some of these offensive linemen uh, needed to cut weight. So I was watching Daniel Calhoun, Marcus Easley. These are guys also that had dropped some weight out there. Uh, so those were some of the things that I took note of. Also, Chaz Chambliss, uh, just just really a, a lot quicker in the drill work than Michael Williams. I think Michael Williams more of a, a rundown guy when they play him at the jack. Um, I'm not sure about his quickness over there. I, I wonder if he'll still play two positions. I'd say I'd probably temper the expectations on Michael Williams being an every down jack. Uh, and I would look for Chaz Chambliss to continue his improvement there. I think that's really good information, Mike. And I want to kind of go through some of what you're bringing up. I make my biases well known. I love my Georgia guys. I love the guys that I saw play in high school. Daniel Calhoun's a guy that I saw play a good bit in high school. You mentioned him a moment ago, in addition to the other young offense line there as well. But as I said before, I'm always going to gravitate a little bit to the guys that I've seen the most. And uh, Calhoun is a guy that, you know, it's, if it's in the two deep, you know, does he crack that sort of backup guard spot, for instance, maybe on the right side or something like that? You know, that's a guy who I sort of wonder, you know, you know, how close could a guy like that come to, you know, perhaps being in that top 10, you know, that that backup right guard or something along those lines of 
of maybe of those sort of incoming freshman offensive linemen, a lot of which I think pretty much all of them were kind of challenged to make sure they're in the, in the tip-top physical condition. You know, does Calhoun have that chance to sort of outpace the rest and maybe be sort of a two-deep offensive lineman here for Georgia here this season? Well, that's tough. You know, you got Michael Morris back there with Dylan Fairchild and Tate Ratledge. I mean, those guards are, that's about as good a garden room as, uh, as you're, you know, really the, the offensive line, the, the depth of quality. It's to the point you worry about some guys leaving, right? When you, when you got that kind of talent stacked up, and, and Kirby will tell you that, that the offensive line is the most difficult position to transition to from high school to college, not just because of the size and the quote unquote man strength, uh, but you also got to learn the offense. And then, and then they also asked their linemen to learn multiple positions. So um, I, I'm not sure, B.A., how quickly uh, Daniel can make an impact on that too deep. I mean, to me, it, I almost feel like Georgia likes to play seven or eight guys, and I got to think Michael Morris is is going to be that guy, whether it's coming in behind Tate or coming in behind Dylan or, or who knows, maybe he beats out uh, Dylan. I don't know. You, the competition is going to be intense at that guard position, uh, as we talked about. It's hard to imagine a true freshman uh, being in that rotation, that seven or eight man rotation, but uh, could he be the ten deep? Could he be the fourth guard? I I suppose uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means relevant playing time. Um, you know, against uh, you know maybe one or one or two of the lesser opponents. I, I just don't know that you throw. And again, you you've seen more of Daniel in action, in game action. Just seems like maybe that might be a lot to ask to throw him out there against Clemson or Kentucky. Yeah, you know who your two left guards are, right? But if even if you're not playing a ton this year, if you're like the chief understudy to Tate on that right side, if you could be that, that can make a big difference, I think, for 2025 there as well. Uh, you mentioned Oscar Dell, but I think it's really important when it comes to Dell. And I like what Kirby said about Oscar yesterday. He didn't say it this way, but I'm going to use Kirby's words to say, it, to say it this way myself. It's almost like you got to pretend that Brock Bowers didn't exist. Brock Bowers is just such a different category of uh, of anything and when you evaluate Oscar Delp you've got to do so with no image of Brock Bowers in your mind because Brock Bowers I think kind of redefined the tight end position but when you evaluate Delp just on his own does he have a chance to be one of the best tight ends in the SEC here this year does he have a chance to be an incredibly valuable weapon for Georgia in both running game and passing game I, I believe that he does I've been pretty high on Oscar for you know most of his career here at Georgia and very different from how Brock Bowers would have gone about his business, but valuable to the Georgia offense nonetheless. I still have a lot of high hopes for, uh, for you know, for Oscar Delp here this year, albeit in a, I would say, much different role than the one that Brock Bowers occupied for the last three years. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think Brock Bowers made the Georgia passing game look a lot better than it really was. Um, he caught a lot of balls from from uh, both uh, Stetson and, and Carson that weren't exactly on target and made a lot of yards after the catch that, you know, at the end of the year, we're marveling over these yards. And a lot of it was Brock Bowers leading the nation uh, uh, tight ends and yards after contact. Um, so, yeah, you, you got to erase that. Uh, I, I like what Oscar does. I mean, I, I look at him as a Charlie Warner. Uh, comparison. I think Charlie's a guy that could have, would have done more in today's offense with the coordinators uh, that, that George has had now with Bobo and, and Munkin. Uh, I like that Georgia goes double tight end. They say, okay, well, maybe, maybe Missouri does have a better receiving core than Georgia. Maybe Luther Burton's better than anybody Georgia has. But you know what? Georgia has better tight ends than any room in the country. And so this is what they're going to do. And being diverse with a two tight end set, otherwise known as the ace BA, really puts a lot of defenses in a bind of how you're going to play against Georgia. Now, what I like about this is you plug in a home run hitting back. Um, you know, Georgia has not had an all SEC running back since 2019. DeAndre Swift, the only all SEC back uh, that Del McGee recruited, believe it or not. Um, but now with Trevor Etienne, I think you've got a 1,000 yard rusher. I think you've got a home run hitter. I think you've got a true feature back. Now, Kirby's got to manage this guy carefully because we could be looking at a 16 or a 17 game schedule for the dogs to win it all. Uh, so you, you can't have Trevor Etienne touch the ball 20 to 25 times early in the year, or he may not be there in December when you really need him. So you mentioned, I heard a moment ago, uh, talking about a guy that I've been high on the whole offseason, uh, Roderick Robinson, being the compliment to Trevor Etienne. If you've got that power back, if Andrew Paul can give you some blue-collar carries and you set up Trevor Etienne for those prime-time moments, I think this is the most dangerous player in your offense. I think Trevor Etienne holds a lot of the keys to Georgia's hopes. And I think he's Carson Beck's best friend. 
I think yeah. this is a guy Carson needs to get to know, to get very comfortable with, because this running back is going to change the way defensive play defenses play the Georgia Bulldogs. And it's been a minute since you've had that guy. Now, could James Cook have been that guy if he had beefed up a little bit more? Uh, Kenny McIntosh, maybe not quite as fast, but the same sort of player. Samir, more a power guy. Uh, but ETN is different. Um, he he kind of is like DeAndre Swift light, right? If he was a little bit thicker, you see that number seven B, I can't help but compare him to Swift. Mm -hmm. The way he changes directions, the vision that he's shown, uh, not sure if he's got the tackle breaking power that DeAndre does, but I was at that Tennessee game. You see the Vols going down in the swamp. If they don't have Trevor Etienne, the Gators aren't beating Tennessee. I don't know if Billy Napier still has a job if they didn't beat Tennessee last year, by the way, but this guy is a game changer. And I think he's the most important addition to the football team. So I agree with the promise of what ETN can be, but he's got to be better for Georgia than he was for Florida. It wasn't leading rush for Florida. You know, this was a guy that was like, you know, in the top 10, but near the bottom of the top 10 in rushing yards of the league last season. You know, this is this is a guy who I think has a lot of promise what he can be. And I agree with you, much like DeAndre Swift, I think he can be used as a weapon during the passing game. But I believe it's really important to to say, as you talk about what ETN can be at Georgia, that the onus here is for the Georgia offense to to use him better than Florida did. Billy Napier had his offensive issues, of course. Obviously, I believe he's playing behind a better offensive line. As I said before, I'm, I'm really bullish on the Georgia offensive line overall. That's to ETN's benefit. But to me, and this is not me being a wet blanket because I like ETN a lot. I like what he can do. But I do think it's really important to, to state matter-of-factly that in order for all of these things to be possible, he just simply has to have a better year for Georgia than he had for Florida. Oh, I agree. Uh, but I would tell you, I think he's better than anybody Georgia had at running back last year, and he might have helped you win an SEC championship if you had him. I, I can't defend Billy Napier's coaching any more than I think you're going to attempt mm -hmm. to do today. Uh, the fact that he had Montrell Johnson ahead of this guy is, I, I know this, B.A., you know that I, I network quite a bit with a lot of writers across the SEC, and one of the guys I talk to a lot is Edgar Thompson of the Orlando Sentinel that covers the Gators, and it was a head-scratcher all year long for what Billy Napier was doing playing this guy behind Montrell Johnson, especially after he went for 172 on Tennessee. Right. But but sometimes coaches do these things. Right. They, they may either they make promises or, uh, you know, for whatever reason, they play one guy ahead of the other guy. It could be what they're paying them, uh, could be guarantees to the family. One guy could practice. Remember, remember how Kirby started Elijah Holyfield over DeAndre Swift? I mean, come on. We weren't sitting here going, well, you know, Kirby's got to do it. If there was a reason for that. And, and we don't know what version of Trevor Etienne. Uh, Billy Napier got maybe Montrell Johnson stayed late after practice every night, or, you know, maybe this is all part of Billy Napier's grand scheme to make this guy work harder. What I do know is that Kirby smart has said ETN has been amazing since he's come through the door, uh, that he's got a fantastic character. Kirby went out of his way to say he's a team leader. And, and we talked about that. Like, wow, a guy walks right in from Florida and he's a team leader in the Georgia offense. Uh, and good for him, but a bit of an indictment on the vacuum of leadership that you have with Bowers and McConkey going out the door and Kendall Milton uh, as well. So the fact that ETN's come in and established a leadership role, according to Kirby Smart, uh, watching Tate Ratlich's podcast, Tate said, you know, dude, you walked in the door and everybody just loves you. And, and then during the podcast, Tate says, we're going to get you 200 yards. I mean, this is like, I'm just, you know, the explosions going over my head like, wow, this is the definition of impact player. And I think you're absolutely right that Georgia has to be able to use this guy better than Florida did. And mm -hmm. again, I, I'm not here to, to defend Billy Napier because I think he's dead man walking. I think he's already fired. I think they already have an idea of who the next guy might be. Who knows? Maybe he'll be at the coaching clinic this weekend wearing a visor at the place where Hugh Freeze coached at one point. Um, but I, I just I don't want to get too far into, well, Billy Napier did that. I think Billy Napier is a knucklehead. I think Kirby Smart is much better at using his talent. Um, and I think that's why George is a contender every year. And if Kirby is propping this guy up, I think we should all listen. All right. Uh, when you started your comments a moment ago, you were starting with wide receivers. I want to circle back to that in the time we have left. And I like what you say about Anthony Evans. And I'll tell you, I think eventually in our show, we're going to get to this at a certain point. We just haven't had time. Yeah. You know who had some really nice things to say about Evans of the day was Marcus Rosemey Jack saying during uh, Pro Day, the the, the interview that, uh, that Rosemey Jack saying did there. He was really kind of boasting on Anthony Evans. And I think a lot of us see – you know, being used as a punt returner against Alabama or getting more time against Florida State, the belief that there could be some momentum that carries over from the end of last season into this season, then that Evans could kind of step out into the forefront of some 
youngish receivers who haven't seen a ton, guys who have been here, though, and then maybe Evans has a chance to sort of step to that forefront. That's going to be – we made a list of, like, guys I'm most interested in seeing on G-Day. Evans would be on my list. I, I, I think there's no doubt about that. Hey, just an electric guy, B.A. You can see the quick tit, quick twitch. You can see how electric he is, the way he moves. Uh, I, I can't quite explain it. I'm, I'm trying to come up with a comp for this guy, and I'm, and I'm struggling to do that. Uh, his hands are so good, though. And he's so quick, and he has such a field awareness. He made this beautiful uh, over-the-shoulder catch on a, on a ball that was, you know, he, he glanced back early and then just, like, blindly caught it. And the timing uh, that was required for a catch like that in full uniform with equipment on, just I, I just said, man, this guy's going to do special things. I can just – I can feel it. I can see it. It's the same sort of feeling that I had about George Pickens early on. I don't know that that he'll, he'll be George because George was amazing – uh, you know, like JT Daniels used to say, you know, it wasn't a 50-50 ball with George. It was a 90-10 ball because of George's ability. I don't know that Anthony will will equal George, uh, but he's that sort of player. You just get the feeling this is a guy that's going to be a difference maker. And, and and Georgia needs that desperately. Let's be honest. The receiving core right now, I mean, love it. Love it was really nothing to get excited about and wasn't able to step up when they needed him. And, you know, I, I rah rah Thomas between the injuries and the slow start. I mean, you hope that that he feels out because when you look at the guys in the uniform, Ra Ra looks good in a uniform, and and you know he had a lot of production at Mississippi State. You hope that 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 translates this year under James Coley, uh, and that Coley is able to get a little bit more out of Ra Ra Thomas, and that maybe Lovett can find that gear that we all thought that he had last year. I almost want to hear that there was something wrong with him because he didn't look nearly as fast or as explosive as I would have thought he would have based on how much more productive he was at Missouri than Georgia from a yards per catch standpoint. Veteran, yes. Tough guy, yes. But didn't bring you that added element that I think you need to be a championship-level receiver. So I need to see more out of the receiving core. That's an area I kind of look at and go, hmm, if Georgia was going to try to add a guy in the portal after spring drills, could it be in the receiving core? Could you land a free agent, electric guy that wants to come here and win a championship and put you over the top? Because other than Anthony Evans, and, and I haven't seen enough out of Colby yet, maybe he'll be that guy. I, I don't know that I'm really excited about the receiving core. Not nearly as excited as I am about ETN and the and uh, and Robinson in the backfield and what the tight ends bring that uh, the just the different ability to line up and put defenses in a bind. And when someone asked me yesterday, well, what's Georgia going to do on offense? I always tell them, and, and you've, you've heard the same thing. It depends on what the defense does. If you're going to try and play them big to go up against that double tight end, then they're going to try to uh, manipulate you on the edges and take advantage of their speed. If you're going to go small and try and cover those tight ends, then they're going to road grade you and run you over. So I think that stays the same. I think the one ace in the hole you've got is Carson Beck uh, is fantastic at pre-snap reads. I think the guy's got a computer chip in his brain. I don't think that he needs the voice in his helmet. Uh, it'll make him that much better. Um, but I think that's what Carson is just so elite at is making the pre-snap reads. Now, when he talks about having the confidence, he's got to have the confidence to go where his brain tells him to go. He can't worry about making mistakes. And that's the big jump for Carson is to get that confidence. We don't need to hear Kirby Smart say in the fall that, that he's not a very assertive guy. That needs to go out the window. He needs to become an assertive guy. He needs to become a confident guy, Brandon. And once he becomes assertive and more confident, the two things that he's mentioned and Kirby's mentioned, then I think he becomes a championship quarterback. All right, Mike, uh, thanks for being here on the uh, program today. Thanks for that uh, perspective, what you saw there at spring practice. For those of us who weren't there, it's always valuable to get that eyewitness account of what's going on down there. We appreciate those multiple sets of eyes here at uh, Dog Nation being a part of all of that. So appreciate your time. We'll look forward to having you back here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Management again very soon there as well. All right. See you, Brandon. Good stuff. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Let me say this about Ra Ra and Dominic Lovett here for a moment. And this is why, if you gave me like one sentence to explain why I'm pretty high on both those guys, at least for this year. Let me say it a different way. I'm very intrigued by both those guys here for this year. Well, thing number one is, A, Terrence Edwards has really touted Ra Ra Thomas. And, you know, the other thing that Mike points out about Ra Ra is he just looks good. You know, he's a good looking player. You know, got a nice, got a nice look. Sort of looks like a receiver that would be very successful. So that's intriguing about, you know, a Ra Ra. You know, Love It is a intriguing guy to me because 
in the absence of Brock Bowers, is there more opportunity for a slot receiver? You know, in the Missouri offense that Eli Drinkwitz favors, slot receivers really get highlighted in that offense. Georgia's a little bit different. You know, Georgia's going to play a lot of two tight end sets, but is there more of an opportunity for someone like uh, Lovett this year because of just more availability for a slot receiver in the game? But beyond that, the other thing that I think that kind of matters here is make the comparison to Tyke Smith for a moment. Just to be completely honest, when Smith first came here, you now he got hurt fairly early into his Georgia career, but pre injury, you know, I got to tell you, you know, some of the buzz that I was hearing was not super positive. I mean, there's a kind of a funny thing. It's like whatever, like, sort of internet circle you kind of favor in terms of your Georgia rumor mill stuff, notice. There's no bad news. You know, bad news typically doesn't leak. The only thing that leaks is good news. You know, so-and-so is in the best shape of his life. That's the sort of thing that leaks. So-and-so showed up 10 pounds overweight. That doesn't leak quite as much. You know, bad news around a spring practice type of thing just sort of has a tendency to stay in-house, whereas you know, the stuff that does kind of travel and kind of get some you know, sort, of, sort of bandwidth on the internet is typically something good. Well, you know, I would say, you know, something that wasn't being said very loud but was being said when, when Tyke Smith first came here is, you know, what does Georgia have in Tyke Smith? Does Tyke run as well as a Georgia defensive back needs to be able to run? But whatever that story started off as, and whatever it was after Tyke's first injury, by the time Tyke finished his Georgia career in 2023, Tyke had proven himself to be a very valuable part of the Georgia defense, and now he's set up to be, I think, a pretty good draft pick based on you know the, the great work that he's been doing as a part of the pre-draft process. In other words, whatever it was that he was when he first got here, coming off an All-American season at West Virginia, a very different league. Uh, you know, whatever it was when he first got here was a totally different player by the time, you know, uh, he finished his Georgia career. So keep that in mind for these journeys that the transfer receivers like Dominic Love and Ra Ra Thomas are going on. You know, it's like, what were they for Georgia a year ago for various reasons? Perhaps, you know, not a major impact on the team, major impact on the season. But previous track record of other Georgia transfer shows that doesn't need to be the way in which Ra-Ra Thomas or Dominic Lovett's story ends. They could still be heard from in a very big way, including this season. That said, let's go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Also keep this in mind. In a couple of minutes here, Kirby Smart, probably as candid as we've heard him on the current NIL culture in college football and what's good, what's not, how it's impacting coaches. We'll give that for you here coming up in just a couple of minutes as well. Prior to that, let's go cruising around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And it's amazing to me, as we're obviously getting ready for our Dog Nation cruise coming up in a few weeks, it is amazing to me, though, the number of people that still come up and talk about the experience of being on board Icon of the Seas, something I had a chance to do back in January, and just the energy that exists around the Royal Caribbean brand here right now because of all the new things they're doing. And here at Dog Nation, we're obviously thrilled to be a part of that. If you're watching a video a moment ago, uh, you see Perfect Day, Coco K. So many of these ships sailing to perfect day coke okay the experience and really is about as much fun as anything you're ever going to do you know the basic theme of the island it's divided into two parts you have the thrill side which is where like the tallest water slide in north america is there's a helium balloon that you can kind of go up in the air in you have the chill side which is more about like the sort of lounging on the beach now ultimately i'm a little bit more of a chill side guy than a thrill side guy but whichever side is sort of you know good for you uh, that opportunity is there there's also the coco beach club if you want kind of an elevated experience or if you want Hideaway Beach for like a really fun experience, then how about Icon of the Seas right there? I was on that ship, for those of you watching on video. How, how much fun was that? So whatever your Royal Caribbean vacation needs are here for 2024, Jessica Slater, special travel agent picked for us by Royal Caribbean. She can help you out with all that. Give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147 for a lot more on that today. All right, let's go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean here for a moment. Interesting drama in Alabama right now where all reports are that Caden Proctor, you'll remember him as an Alabama offensive lineman who transferred to Iowa just a few weeks ago. Well, the rumor mill is after going on a spring break trip with some former Alabama players, Proctor has rethought his decision to go to Iowa. And now it's being, you know, there, this starts off as a rumor, but now it's being reported that Proctor is going to transfer back to Alabama. And I guess in this day and age, can you do that? I reckon you can do just about anything you want to do, and that's apparently what Proctor's going to be doing right here. Now, there has been some rumor stuff of, and Caleb Downs is going to do the same thing. 
The best that I can tell, this is wishful thinking. Uh, you know, maybe this turns into something. A lot of people were sort of running with one of those like cryptic, I know something you don't know style tweets from uh, the guy from 24 7, Josh Pate. Some of y'all know him. People were kind of running with that, trying to make that into a thing. Um, but for now, this is just a Proctor story. Does it become a story about somebody else at some point in time? Maybe so. But for now, this is just a Proctor story. The, the, the one rumor that's almost always false is so-and-so has taken all references to whatever school off his social media. People, people do that kind of thing all the time. It almost never turns out to be anything. But the Proctor thing does appear to be real here for right now. And if anything else becomes real, we'll talk about that too. But for now, the Proctor thing is real. And to me, here's what, what this demonstrates. That we have talked a lot lately about the, about the Big Ten trying to be more like the SEC demanding the same revenue from the college football playoff as a, for instance. And we've looked around and said, are we sure these two leagues should be treated as equals given the imbalance of success between the two leagues? As we pointed out many, many times, the Big Ten success is more in the boardroom, more at the cash register. It is a very lucrative league because it is a huge footprint with big alumni bases, big states, populous areas. And that obviously creates the chance for uh, TV ratings and revenue and things like that. That's where the Big Ten is successful. They want to be more successful on the field in comparison with the SEC. This past season, they were able to do that. Obviously, Michigan won the national championship. But the last few days, we get a reminder, even for a relatively new SEC coach like Kalen DeBoer, that there is just a certain level of aggression that exists in the SEC that the Big Ten's will have a hard time matching. You know, DeBoer loses Proctor to Iowa, and then you have the gall, the ambition to take him back. Honestly, that's Kalen DeBoer. We don't like Alabama, and we don't, uh, you know, tout them. There's plenty of people in the media that make that their whole personality. We don't feel the need to join in on that. But in this particular case, if DeBoer has done this, pulled Proctor back from Iowa after transferring, that's a win. That's a you need to do something to demonstrate your SEC ness, you know, your 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 SEC credentials to your 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 Alabama fan base. And I would say this is an example of DeBoer kind of doing that. It also kind of goes in line with me of Trev Alberts, you know, Nebraska grad, sitting there as athletic director, since you're treating that as a dream job, and then Texas A&M comes in, money whips them, and pulls Alberts away from his alma mater to make him uh, AD there at Texas A&M. So we've seen a couple of examples lately of SEC teams acting very much like the SEC at the expense of the Big Ten. So an interesting contrast between the way the two leagues go about their business. Stepping outside the SEC for a moment, Clemson yesterday filed suit against the ACC, basically all of this is about, you know, the grant of rights and what happens uh, in the event that the, uh, the the league is dissolved. What, what, what are your opportunities for getting out of the league? I guess the one difference, I, don't, I hate to get into legalese because I'm just not always smart enough to understand all this, but I think one of the big differences between what Florida State's pursuit is and what Clemson's pursuit is right now in terms of a possible exit from the league, something we know that Clemson would like to do, is Clemson doesn't dispute, apparently, that the ACC currently owns the, the rights to the you know, Clemson television product, right? If, if, you know, if Clemson's on TV, the money generated from that is the, is the right of the ACC right now because of the contract. However, I guess there's some belief that the ACC contract with each of its teams would stipulate that if you leave the ACC, the ACC would still own your media rights. And that's essentially a very punitive Thing placed into a contract to essentially prevent you from ever even wanting to leave because it's just so onerous from a cost standpoint if you were. That's what Clemson seems to be wanting to fight, a little bit different than the argument made against Florida State. So clearly the, the, the league is being held together right now by just a thread. The power programs within the league are doing everything they can to see if they're able to break apart. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, like I said before, I'm not a lawyer, but the best that I can tell – the number one argument for both Florida State and Clemson seems to center around, yeah, we signed this deal, but it's no longer convenient for us to be enforced by this agreement. And I just don't quite know how that's supposed to go in court, but that seems to be the argument here right now from a non-legal mind. Uh, on a much lighter note, <laughs> so Lane Kiffin the other day uh, was making fun of uh, Jim Harbaugh, which we're totally in favor of. We find Harbaugh to be pretty annoying. I got to admit, let me show you this on the screen. Then we have this for you. So College Football Report put this out. A photo from Jim Harbaugh is obviously leaving Michigan, moving to, to Florida. Uh, excuse me, to California, which is going to be the coach of the Chargers. And Harbaugh had a yard sale. 
Now, Kiffin saw this on X and laughed about it. You see the laughing emojis if you're watching on um, video here. And I get the idea. It seems somewhat funny that a coach like Jim Harbaugh that lives in a house like that, it looks like a shopping center, but, the, but you live in a house like that, you would have a yard sale. But if I was a Michigan fan, I mean, how cool would this be to have a yard sale with your former coach? And there's no telling what kind of Michigan gear he's probably got, Michigan paraphernalia, memorabilia, things like that. I'd love to have that. Like, I, see, when I was a kid, my dad used to, as a way of making a little bit of extra money, things like that, he used to set up and sale at flea markets. I don't even know if we still have, like, flea markets anymore. I used to love a flea market when – People were selling like their old junk. This is back when I was getting baseball cards, and this is also back before baseball cards got as big as they would get. You'd see just a shoebox of old baseball cards or like some old toys or like just just all kinds of old stuff. I've always just liked old stuff. And I got to tell you, I bet Jim Harbaugh's got some cool old stuff. Like uh, a few years ago, obviously, um, you know, we miss him every day. But when Coach Dooley was still with us, I had a chance to interview Coach Dooley, and I got to go do it at his house. And we kind of sat in his sort of like, kind of like his memorabilia room. And you just look around and it's like, it's stuff that you'd expect to see, but it was also just sort of really interesting, sort of odd things that you would have never guessed. Just all this cool stuff that coaches collect over the course of their lifetime. I mean, I don't like Jim Harbaugh, but if I was a Michigan fan, would I want a chance to buy some of that stuff? I think a yard sale at Coach like Harbaugh's house is probably a pretty fun thing to do, I think, anyway. So uh, pretty good stuff there. Uh, Lane Kiffin laughs at it. I understand why you're laughing at Jim Harbaugh. But nonetheless, a little coach's yard sale, get a chance to get some sort of odds and end type memorabilia. I think I'd probably enjoy that. Anyway, we'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Now, good stuff coming up from Kirby Smart here. Before we do, let me give a shout-out to our friends at Dr. Pepper. Y'all know we're coming towards the end of our show here, which means for me, I'm just a little bit away from being able to enjoy a great sort of early, you know, afternoon, late morning treat. Uh, my own Dr. Pepper, of course, the rich one-of-a-kind flavor. So when you're picking up your groceries at Kroger, wherever you're doing your shopping, pick up some Dr. Pepper. Enjoy that. The 23 flavors. In fact, when you see the can, the number 23, that's why it's on there. Uh, it's the 23 flavors of Dr. Pepper. We love it around here. We're so happy to have them as a part of the show. Make sure you check out some Dr. Pepper today. Now, we started the show today by playing some interesting audio and showing the video of uh, Kirby Smart talking about one of the players he's been impressed with during spring practice here thus far. Near the end of yesterday's press conference, Kirby Smart also got into a good bit on kind of the, the, the rumblings that are out there that some coaches are just so dissatisfied with the current nature of the NIL culture around college football, they're looking to just get out of the sport, that they're just they're going to the NFL, they're retiring, they're, you know, whatever. They're just looking to get out of coaching – they are so unhappy with this. And Smart kind of shot some of that down from his own perspective, but did talk honestly and openly about kind of what he sees as, you know, I think some questions to be answered about all this. I like when Kirby gets into this kind of stuff. He got into it yesterday. Let's take a moment to hear this from Kirby Smart yesterday. Yeah, I, I think the leaders are going to do a great job positioning us for the future in terms of what they do. The choice of each college coach is – obviously up to the college coaches. I mean, um, there's certainly uh, higher stakes and higher pay than there's ever been uh, for college coaches across the board. I mean, there's 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 the guys making money and making livings that, you know, coordinators can retire now. They don't have to go get a head job. You look back even 10 years ago, how much has changed uh, for coaches. So there's no uh, there's no crying out there from, from, from my end. I, I, w I want what's best for the student athlete. And sometimes I question the system we have now if it's best for the student athlete because it's not it, it's not necessarily best for the sophomore, junior, and senior. It may be best for the freshman, but it may not be best for the sophomore, junior, and senior. I would see I would love to see a little more fair system for the players in terms of within the players. Uh, but there's not a lot of I, I don't have a lot of coaches complaining saying they want to get out of the profession. They enjoy the profession. They want the profession to be about relationships, developing talent, and rewarding positive performance both on and off the field. And that comes through what you've done in your body of work of being there, not necessarily uh, where it's a reverse system of the younger players who sometimes get more than the older players. There are two things I want to say about this. Thing number one is this. We started our week by saying, coming off a very busy recruiting weekend for Georgia, 
it's nice to see in the midst of so much chaos, Georgia is still, for the most part, business as usual. Still hosting impressive recruits, still making a strong impression on those recruits, seemingly set up well to win some pretty important recruiting battles. That NIL seemingly is changing everything, but the results for Georgia remain somewhat the same. And Kirby Smart says there, there's no crying on our end about NIL because we're just rolling up our sleeves and doing what needs to be done. If you're a Georgia fan, that's exactly what you want to hear, and you heard that from Kirby Smart. I would also say this. that when Kirby Smart says, hey, you know, we need to talk about, you know, how to make the NIL system fair for everybody, I would treat that seriously. I don't take that as empty rhetoric. And let me give you an example of, uh, of what I mean by that. Smart talks about sometimes it's the younger players, freshmen who haven't done anything, who are making more money than the older, more proven players. And some people would say, hey, that's, that's just the free market. That's the way that it goes, as I say all the time. You know, your value is not determined by your ability. It's your marketability. And sometimes, you know, incoming freshmen have a little bit more freedom of movement, more freedom of choice. Maybe they demand more money. That's fine. But if you're a player, you got to think about, okay, what's most fair for me? Because here's the thing. Every program, no matter what the dollar figure is, every program has a finite amount of NIL money uh, that they're working with. And so if so-and-so incoming five-star commands – X number of, you know, whatever, $100,000 prize, to get that money above what you would maybe like to pay, you just got to take it from another player. And as the NIL system moves forward, we're going to see more and more of that. The market's going to become more efficient, whereas the really high-value player is going to make more and more, and that's going to come at the expense of the other players unless the, the players themselves have a conversation among themselves of, You know, what makes the most sense to all of us and what's the way to make this more fair for all of us within the, you know, the confines of uh, of the agreements that they're able to make? I'd say the same thing about the transfer portal there as well. Some people believe that it's pro player to have unlimited transfers, total freedom, total chaos within the system. And if you're one of the players transferring, I guess that's good for you. But what if you're a player that's been in a program for three years waiting for your turn and then right now when it's your time to be a starter – uh, so-and-so program brings in a transfer player and just sort of moves you right out of the way after you've been waiting 36 months for your shot. See, everything is fair for somebody, and every system is sort of unfair for somebody else. And what's the most fair to the most people? I think Kirby Smart's right to say that's the question that college football ought to be considering. I like that from Kirby Smart yesterday. One more thing before we wrap up here today. Um, a lot of you, and I'm telling you, it's been great now. The people who sent me their information yesterday, I haven't gotten back to all of you yet. I had a little bit of an issue this morning as I was doing that. Some of you I reached out to, some of you I haven't. Everyone who is giving me info here, I'm reaching personally out to all of you about this just because I want this to be fun. It's our Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge. So many of you get your picks in. We've got until noon tomorrow when the games tip off to get our brackets filled out and get them in. So if you want to be a part of our Golden Shoe Bracket Contest, this is like sort of low-key, kind of low stakes, not for money. We're just doing this for fun. We're going to let the winner come on and take a bow here and uh, celebrate on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pass Management. But if you want to be a part of this, all I want to ask you to do is just email me. My email address, brandon.adams at dognation.com. brandon.adams at dognation.com. Give me your name, your email, your mailing address, your phone number. I just want to have – we're going to try to give out some additional prizes if we can. Uh, But also, if you win, I want to be able to contact you so you can be on the show and celebrate your uh, victory. So give me your contact information, your name, your email, your mailing address, your phone number, and then um, send that over to uh, brandon.adams at dognation.com. you got one more day to get involved. Games tip off tomorrow. So get in prior to the, the, the tomorrow when the brackets lock, and uh, we'll get you up and running and all that. We've had a great response. I love to see it. And I've really enjoyed interacting back and forth with a lot of you who've been with us for a long time or having some fun with that. Just really appreciate you being a part of the uh, program. So uh, very good stuff indeed. One more day to get involved in our Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge. So good stuff there. And as we wrap up with our Golden Shoe here today, uh, we will uh, show a little love here to Stephen Burton, who's part of our audience, and he's also a big collector as well, I believe. And he he reaches out to let us know that he got the greatest birthday present ever. He says, go wreck the NFL now. What he's referencing here is a Brock Bowers autographed jersey. How cool is this? And what you love about Bowers is, so he signs the number one in his number 19. And in the number nine, 
which is the other part of his number, of course. He says 21-22 national champs. A little personalized autograph from Brock Bowers there. How much do you love him celebrating that back-to-back -back national championships in his personal inscription there? So uh, really fun stuff from Brock Bowers. Happy birthday to Stephen there on that. Walking away with a Brock Bowers jersey. Uh, great birthday present indeed. That is our golden shoe for today. Lousy, stinking gators. Of course, a lot of Brock Bowers' success came at the hands of those lousy, stinking gators, and it's been 1,229 days since Florida's beaten Georgia. We will see all of you back tomorrow on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Management. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, when you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs, they show up on time. They do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that. All right, let's get your comments here right now. As a part of our cool down, we'll go across all the, the various platforms and find out what people have to say. I'm going to start on Facebook today, and then we'll see what's going on there. Of course, all of you hopefully getting ready to enjoy a good afternoon. Maybe you watched the uh, uh, NIT tournament last night. Jordan getting a win over Xavier. That was fun. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, on the uh, Facebook side of things. Uh, Matt Rukavine on the subject of Tony Bennett in Virginia. Uh, yeah, the uh, 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 Virginia Cavaliers, after all the, the hype about, you know, would they get in over, like, Indiana State or uh, Seton Hall, some of the teams that some folks thought were more deserving. Uh, yeah, pretty pretty bad, pretty bad disaster for uh, Virginia last night, you know, losing to what, Colorado State in the uh, first four. So, you know, the, 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 the program that became the first ever to lose a 116 game also um, also loses in the uh, first four there last night. Al Chandler wondering what my take is on Branson Robinson coming back and being in really good shape. Obviously, I'm a big believer in Robinson and what he can be for Georgia, but I'm also really, really trying to be as realistic as I possibly can be about the current nature of um, – uh, of his injury recovery. I just think what he, the injury that he suffered was a, was a very serious one. And my guess is that's the kind of recovery that probably takes him well into, you know, this year at least before he's like sort of fully healthy again. And the very best of, um, of, of Robinson, I would say, is probably more likely 2025 than 2024, perhaps. Uh, so I still like Robinson as much as I ever did, but I'm also trying to operate on a realistic timeline when he can be back fully healthy and contributing once again. Bill Sanders on the sub. We talked about this for our first and 15 a little earlier. Um, uh, South Korea, Major League Baseball season began very, very early this morning. I, I said I said Dodgers-Giants because it was Dodgers-Padres. So uh, Major League Baseball, it's kind of that sort of one-off international game, and then you know everybody kind of gets going here in a little bit. But uh, But this was a regular season game today taking place in South Korea. Jamie Huff says our offense is going to be explosive. Uh, great as Brock was spreading the ball around. Uh, he says great as Brock was spreading the ball around is always better. And that's obviously an opportunity for Georgia to do that here this year. Um, Mike Mazzell, who was one of the very first. Like Mike, when we, the moment we gave the first thing there on, uh, on uh, Monday, I guess it was, Mike jumped right in. He was one of the very first one. And uh, he got his bracket done. Stephen England says he's got his done too. I appreciate you guys being a, a part of this. I really do. I appreciate you guys being a part of this. Um, Jacob O'Neill says that's how they know. Uh, people know that I'm bougie. Is that because of the flea markets? Listen, I love flea markets. I don't even know that you have, like, true flea markets anymore. You know, I think I just don't, like people just sort of selling their old junk, I guess. Now they just do that on, like, Facebook Marketplace. For, for, for whatever reason, that's not the same thing for me. You know, to me, uh, a flea market's supposed to be where, like, you just walk in there, you don't even know what you're going to see. I mean, just like, you know, stuff that's collectible, stuff that you think might be collectible that actually probably isn't. You know, you know that's what it kind of all uh, sort of comes down to for me. Uh, no, Jay Shapes, I'm not going to sell your personal information. Um, Croaking123 says, be patient with Branson. This is on YouTube. Uh, but hopefully he bounces back. Yeah, I mean, I just think patience is the right thing here. Because, I mean, the, the comparison I made over and over again, I know we had 1,000 yards that year, but like Nick Chubb in 2016, one year off of his horrific injury was not the same guy he would be in 2017. And then, you know, beyond that, going into the NFL. 
that some of this stuff just takes some time. It just does. Uh, Lance D says there's a big flea market in Pendergrass off I-85. So I remember that one used to be. Um, I, I guess it's still there. Um, that's good to know. Good to know. But, like, one time I went there and I felt like a lot of the vendors were, like, people with, like, tax ID. You know what I'm saying? It's like they're selling, like, wholesale goods, things they bought from, like, some sort of wholesale distributor. Like, these were, like, and nothing wrong with people having, you know, like, legitimate businesses. But the old days of the flea market, ain't nobody had a tax ID. And this was, you know, this was uh, this was just, you know, your Uncle Johnny with a truck full of old furniture or something like that. I, uh, like, that to me is a real flea market. Uh, uh, you know, sort of bartering in cash and, you know, nobody's... <laughs> That to me is what a real flea market is. Uh, Croaking123 says there's a flea market in his area. Best flea markets are also up in the mountains, too. Uh, up there in the mountains, though, there are always good flea markets up there. Jonathan Aaron says Macon's got a big flea market. See, that's good to know. Daniel Nelson mentioned Smiley's flea market. So there you go. Um, uh, so there you go. Paul Moon says this is going to be the best, our best chance to get a thousand yard receiver since a and uh, since uh, Aaron Murray's time. He says a wiser back and loosening up some of those targets should help someone get a thousand yards. Boy, I certainly hope so. That'd be great, and I, you know, I think it could happen. That'd, that'd be great. Um, that'd be great. Uh, Spencer Clark wants everybody to grab some signed rookie cards of Brock Bowers. Listen, I do think that's fun. I think that'd be a great thing to collect. Uh, there's, you know, Bowers already got some cards. He's in the uh, Bowman University set, which is really fun. It's, it's kind of, I was talking to a uh, card dealer the other day because, you know, sometimes the Bowman University product is a little bit hard to find around this area. It's the, it's the cards of the guys who are in college. And I asked the guy, I said, is it, is it this popular everywhere? Is it just popular down here because of how much we like college football? And to a certain extent, there's a little bit of a regional driven, you know, market for that. But if you want to, you know, collect some Bauer stuff, I think Beck's got some cards in there. There are a lot of Georgia guys have been in there. Uh, that's a pretty fun product. Um, let's see what else. Spencer Clark says NFL teams think our wide receivers are underused. Well, I mean, look, here's the one thing that I think has got to be kind of the – sort of blanket over all of that conversation. Individual players could have certainly had bigger numbers, perhaps, but you can't argue with the overall team success. As I've pointed out many times, over the course of the last two seasons, Georgia and USC are the only two teams in America that have averaged 40 points per game for each of the last two seasons. Now, everybody would expect USC to be there because that's Lincoln Riley and uh, Caleb Williams. I don't know that everyone would expect Georgia to be in that category, but that's what Georgia's gotten done. So I've said before, we're going to talk more about this at some point this week, that you know, I, I'd like to see Georgia balance out its touchdowns, you know, passing to receiving to go a little bit more along the line of the balance that it has, you know, with it with its rushing and, and throwing yards. But ultimately that's kind of nitpicking a, a very successful formula overall, where, you know, Georgia's obviously one of the best offenses in America, even if it hasn't meant, you know, individual glory oftentimes for all the players who sort of play in here. Justin Young says we need more balance, uh, especially, I would say, especially in terms of the touchdown distribution. I'd like to see that between rushing and throwing. Um, Philip Wells says old national discount flea market mall. I don't know where that is, but that sounds exactly like something I would like. That sounds exactly like something I would like. Um, or maybe that was a joke. Spencer Clark is laughing. Maybe that's a joke. Um, uh, Lance D says the NFL's Instagram page posted the question of Brock Bowers, the best tight end we've seen. Uh, Lance says a lot of the replies say Kyle Pitts, but we know that's nonsense. Yeah, I would say so uh, thus far. And I expect Brock Bowers to have a much more productive NFL career in the early going than what, um, what Kyle Pitts has had for the Falcons here thus far. Uh, Daniel Nelson says he would like to see Chaz Chambliss have a long NFL career, but intrigued by what his potential MM MMA career could be. Like, like one of the things that I thought about Chaz when he was in high school was, uh, you know, he was really like rocked out for like a high school guy in a way that you sometimes don't always see, like, you know, big muscular physique. And, you know, like 
I mean, it certainly appears that fighting Chas Chambliss would be an unpleasant experience. So him being successful in MMA, obviously, I would say there's a really good chance that's the case. Uh, or at least a you know a chance. Now, that's also a very specific skill set. Uh, but if anybody looks like they could be a fighter, I mean, I would say Chaz probably looks like that way. Uh, Jacob enjoying the fact that uh, uh, Philip Jordan Wells is on the yeah. Philip's been this is either Philip or like a reasonable fact something thereof. He's been migrating towards YouTube uh, a good bit more. Bill Shirley says there's a big flea market in Jacksonville, Florida. See, I'm glad to know that there's more of these flea markets. And, like, sometimes you go to, like, this is a very difficult thing to explain, but there's also these things like antique malls. And for whatever reason, I don't like antique malls. To me, antique malls, where, like, you have, like, a big room and a lot of different vendors in those rooms, I sort of feel like that's trying to be like a flea market, but it's a lot of stuff that sort of, priced higher than it probably should be. Whereas I think a flea market, like a true flea market, you've got good stuff that's probably priced a little lower than it could be. So I know that's a weird sort of, you know, contrast to strike. Big fan of flea markets, but if it says like antique mall on the awning, I probably don't like that quite as much. Yeah, see, Philip Wells got all kinds of these in here. I, I bet I'd like all those. I need to get out and do more of that. Greg Hendricks says, my daughter named uh, my grandson Stetson. There you go. How, well, first of all, congratulations on the uh, grandchild, Greg. And also, what a cool name. That's awesome to see, Greg. Awesome to see. Congratulations, indeed. Right, we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Let's go get a few more comments before we get ready to, to, to get out of here today. Let me go to dognation.com. DT back in here today. Uh, PDT says, how many people are in the Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge? i got to go count it up and see. It's growing, though. I, it, the response has been terrific. You know, I didn't have high expectations for, like, a 1,000 people or anything like that just because we have, a, you know, you know, we're not, you know, blasting it out all over the place. But uh, a, a good number of people, and it seems like it's a lot of people who, um, you know, have been, uh, you know, been with us for a while, too, which is really fun. Speaking of people who've been with us for a while, Mitt Layton going to be our Dog Nation cruise saying, looking forward to seeing you in the gang in a month in the Dog Nation cruise. Yeah, Mitt's always so much fun to be on the cruise with. A great guy, and uh, we're so happy to have Mitt as a part of our program. That's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, UGA72 Dog said about Jim Harbaugh, the reason why he had the, had the yard sales because his wife said she didn't want to move all that stuff. There's probably some truth to that. There's probably some truth to that. Um. West GA Dog Fan says he wants two days at Perfect Day Coco K. I'd like that as well. I would. I'd, I'd take as many days as I can get. I don't believe I'd ever get tired of Perfect Day Coco K. West GA Dog Fan says there's a flea market in Gainesville, Florida, too. Um, well, yeah, and ironically, uh, in Gainesville, Florida, not only is there a flea market, there's also plenty of fleas there as well, or at least the sort of annoying pests that are uh, Florida fans. He says, yeah, it's called the swamp. That's really funny. That's really funny. Um, Johnny Prescott on the subject of what Mike was referencing with the next Florida coach. Now, I don't believe he's talking about Gus Malzahn. I believe he's talking about Lane Kiffin. I believe he was referencing Kiffin as perhaps the next Florida coach. Uh, DT, happy to hear some nice words about Jared Wilson. Uh, DT says he's been driving today, not able to comment. Well, listen, keep your hands at 10 and 2. Stay safe out there. I'm obligated to say that. All right, final comments. Oh, dog uh, gone. Tony says uh, Nate McBride was the uh, the Jack man for the uh, Na for, uh, for the winning team in NASCAR on Sunday. With well, this is Bristol, right? Uh, who won the Bristol race? I, didn't, I don't, didn't even know if I even saw that. But uh, that's great, boy. That's what a cool thing. That's that, that's a really fun thing. Uh, good for Nate McBride. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, I need to learn more about that. That's really cool. Denny Hamlin, is, is Denny the one that won? Did it, Denny Hamlin win? Andrew Hughes says, uh, should we look for a breakout player at wide receiver or running back? Well, this is one of those things where, you know, I think the buzz about Roderick Robinson has been pretty good. We gave you a practice report on that today. I've heard decent things about Andrew Paul here thus far. But the safer bet's going to be at wide receiver because it's just a larger number. Uh, in other words, 
if we said, hey, however you define breakout, you're going to get to, we're going to battle each other. One of us is going to take wide receiver, one of us is going to take running back. You'd be always better off to take wide receiver just because it's a larger number of, uh, of guys. So I think the wide receiver is the better overall answer there. Baggins and friends said, I almost said I make some of this stuff up. Uh, what was it that I made up? Listen, <laughs> you know, so some of the stuff that comes out of my mouth, I sort of wonder, did I just make that up? But, um, but I try not to anyway. I try not to anyway. Foster Moss says you go to some of those antique malls and flea markets around Florida, you can find a lot of Florida gear. There are a lot of gators, lousy, stinking gators discarding that, uh, that Florida gear. That is definitely true. Definitely true. Um, some of y'all were talking about Caitlin Clark in the YouTube comment section. Like, admittedly, I don't watch a ton of women's college basketball. I, I, I just can't pretend to be anything other than what I am. Uh, I, and I, I don't have not watched a ton of that sport throughout time. But I am fascinated by Caitlin Clark in this tournament. A, she's going to get big ratings. All of her games always do. But I was also nowhere near the best team, right? I mean, there are probably at least two teams in the SEC better than Iowa, right? I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I know LSU beat them a year ago. South Carolina is probably better as well. Um, so here's what I'm sort of fascinated by. The hot takes about Caitlin Clark are going to be phenomenal, like the Stephen A. Smith, Skip Bayless stuff related to, you know, all-time leading score but can't win the big one or, you know, perhaps – she does find a way to win and what that turns into like the, the, like I, I don't know that I'll watch the games, but I will absolutely absorb all the content on the other side of that. Cause there, there, there's going to be some good hot takes. There's going to be some good hot takes there. And I'm not like against it or anything. It's just my dance card's pretty full as it is. Um, uh, Andrew Hughes celebrating the Georgia basketball team getting a postseason win last night against Xavier. Yeah, it was a pretty fun time. Uh, we were joking about this during our first and 15. The final, like, 1.9 seconds took about 25 minutes to play, but it was a good time. It was a good time. Um, Nature, Gets, Nature Gator says that uh, nobody's discarding any uh, UF gear uh, except the, the, what's got ETN on the back of it. So there you go. Florida fans not happy with ETN. Uh, my guess is, though, that herd's been thinned out a little bit. I mean, and listen, this is just the nature of it. You know, Georgia's experiencing this right now. Fan base gets larger when you're winning. There's just no doubt about that. Fan base gets larger when you're winning. And I welcome people into the fan base. I want new fans to come in because I think being a Georgia football fan is one of the great experiences you could ever have. Uh, it makes your life better, I believe. Uh, more fun, anyway. And so I welcome new fans into the fold here and glad to have you as a part of uh, our program. Uh, but everybody kind of does that. When Florida was winning all those games back in 2008, which, by the way, now is a very long time ago, when Florida's winning all those games, you can't tell me they were Florida fans then that somehow that Florida gear made its way to an antique mall or a, or a, uh, you know, a, a Goodwill or something like that. Uh, that Florida fan base herd has been thinned out a little bit. Don't think we don't notice when we tune in on Saturdays. Um, DT says he got some great furniture at the Lakewood flea market. Uh, the Haywood uh, Wakefield uh, mid-century modern. Well, there you go. How about that? How about that? There you go. Um, all right. Last stuff. We got to go here. All right, let's get ready to wrap it up for today. As always, appreciate you being here. Um, yeah, Stick D says, bigger question on the defensive side of the ball about who's going to plug the gaps and hold the edge against the opposing offenses. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously one of Georgia's biggest issues a year ago, and they're certainly working to do everything they can to get that fixed here right now. I think that's a really good point. All right, thank you for being here as a part of our R.S. Andrews Cool Down today. Y'all find R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs, including as the spring gets here. going to be nice weather today, I believe, and hot weather here pretty soon. As it gets here, make sure you get everything tuned, back, your air conditioning unit tuned back up to factory fresh specs so you can be ready for the spring that's on its way. Find more out at rsandrews.com. That's rsandrews.com. As I said to you earlier, I know Dari payro has got himself probably 100 different brackets he's involved with. And so if you want to be like Dari and get involved in a bracket contest, we got one for you there as well here at Dog Nation Daily. 
It's our Golden Shoe Bracket Contest. You got one more day to get involved. So send me an email, brandon.adams at dognation.com. Brandon.adams at dognation.com. Just give me your contact, your name, your email, your mailing address. and your Because the reason why, because I'm trying to send out some more prizes in addition to just the uh, grand prize. Uh, name, email, mailing address, phone number. Send that to me, and um, oh, we'll get you involved in the bracket contest. I'm personally writing back to everyone who writes in here, giving you a link for our uh, our contest there. So that's a lot of fun. So I'll talk to you then via email. And, of course, back here tomorrow for our R.S. Andrews Cooldown. And then prior to that, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Braden Pest Management. We'll look forward to talking to you then, everybody.